So welcome everyone. My name is Christian Zassan, the astronomer in charge of iTelescope. I'm really delighted to give you, to bring to you a very special event and a very special guest. It's going to go right into the history. We're going to Central America. We're going to Peru, to the very high altitudes incredible high altitudes, 3,400 meters, 11,000 feet somewhere. I mean, if you've been to Quito uh, in, um, in Ecuador, you'll, you think that's high. Well, then you go to, the, to Cusco, and that's where the planetarium is from Ana Maria Mia, who is our today's special guest, very special in many ways, because she's built this planetarium up with very little help. It's something that we just cannot even begin to comprehend how difficult that is to cope with very little means and to do things with very few means. So this is very special. If you've ever been near the equator, you will know that imaging can be very special because you can go both to the southern and to the northern hemisphere. And also the equatorial mount is quite crazy because you're almost parallel, you know, you're, you're almost parallel to, to, to the horizon, right? Because, uh, you, you, you know, you're putting, you, you, you really have to see whether you align to the north or the south depending on which side of the equator it is so it's really pe peculiar so Anna Maria I don't know if you're there I just talked to you for a few a few minutes ago there you are very nice to have you very excited and thanks again to Sikanda for making this possible so Anna Maria it's all yours we're really excited to get go into dark constellations today so I'll be quiet now and you can take over thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you my, very much for the invitation. I'm extra super happy of being uh, with you tonight. No, this afternoon, sorry, not tonight yet. <laughs> and uh, yeah, especially to share you the wonderful legacy that we got of our ancestors, the Incas, their understanding of the skies. And because diversity uh, is needed in such beautiful things as astronomy for expand our universes that's it okay so yeah um let me share my screen i think uh, we practice this I, th I think it's okay already yes <laughs> it's visible wonderful okay you're sharing and um, yeah and yes my name is Ana maria i'm very glad to give you this little lecture little speech about the incan astronomy yeah uh Oh, I have to be somewhere else. Just a second. Okay, I think this is it. Okay. And uh, what is kind of uh, unique about the Incas is that we used to have, I would love to say that we are the only in the world, but sadly no. <laughs> oh, happily no. Yeah, we have other civilizations that interpreted the dark areas of the Milky Way as another kind of constellations. This is me. I'm director of Planetarium Cusco, a private project that is very focused on the spring astronomy as a science, but also giving the people the knowledge about the Incan astronomy. And we have a small but very beautiful observatory uh, of the skies, especially the southern the skies. However, just 13 degrees out from the equator give us a wonderful spectacle right there, okay? Um, from Cusco, uh, my family have a long tradition of intellectuals, but also entrepreneurs, and I'm a combination of both of them, of my ancestors. I'm an author of three books of poetry. I'm a floral artist and a very proud mama. See, I love to make research about the Incan culture, and I love to make lectures about science and about uh, cultural astronomy of the Incas, yeah? Um, the cultural astronomy is something that it's growing, and um, more and more people is getting interested into it. Even the International Astronomic Union is more interested in uh, giving the world other looks of the skies, yes? I copied this because it's very important <laughs> to really get this, yes? Uh, and especially in this English, but because English is not my native language, okay? Cultural astronomy is the study of the astronomy of ancient cultures. It's sometimes called anthropology of astronomy too. 
In many ways, that astronomy was used by ancient cultures as um, fascinated, and this could be used to inspire interest in all astronomy, believe me. I see that on a daily basis as uh, well in astronomy and culture. Arc astronomy is interdisciplinary and among its practitioners are not only astronomers and astrophysicists, but also anthropologists, archeologists and indigenous scholars. Uh, like me. <laughs> Much can be learned about ancient culture through examination of how and why they use astronomy. But also just for any regular person, this is absolutely fascinating because every single human being <laughs> uh, is hungry for stories, yeah, especially stories of the sky. And if we add the local elements, uh, it's for everybody also, yeah, that's what I feel uh, in my, in the, um, things that I do at my work, yeah. It's important to tell you to understand the Incas, yes, and how they interpret the skies is that the main use for ancient civilizations to interpret the sky was also for having somewhere to wrote the interpretation that they got about nature and our cycles, okay? Uh, they are always, they were always connected, yeah? We have to look at the patterns in the sky to see, oh, this pattern is when it's raining, when it's not raining, when we uh, the birds are coming or just anything that go, is going on on earth must be reflected in the sky. And this is a never ending connection that we got. And the cultural astronomy, we want to call it this way, is the bridge for this, yeah? So uh, I'm trying to make this presentation with the concept of space time. Yeah, we have to talk about the space and we have to talk also about time to know this. So if we want to talk about the skies of the Incas, we have to talk about the land of the Incas first. We are located in a very special uh, location. Our country is not as wide as Canada, <laughs> yeah? But here we have condensed so many geographical factors together that is wild, okay? There is a lot of things going on here on nature. The first thing is that, yes, as Christian said, we are just below the equator. You can see the equator right here. And uh, Lima, the capital of Peru, is 12 degrees south. Cusco is 13 degrees south from the equator, yeah? And uh, I know that... Uh, you are a group of people that gets this concept, but I always like to explain that because for some regular people, it's not always it's not always aware of this, yes? That if you live between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, you are tropical, okay, because of that. And tropical is not only the amazing music we make, no? <laughs> it's the just geographical area. But we got... Um, the, the idea that tropical is going to be uh, beautiful beaches or uh, amazing jungles, but we got something else going on here. And it's the Pacific Ocean. You say, what? No, get in there, get in there. <laughs> if you see the Pacific Ocean, everybody that is around the Pacific Ocean, of course, not only Peru, is above of what we call the Ring of Fire. The ring of fire is a huge thing <laughs> deep down here that is a, like a veil, yeah, that uh, makes this area the one that has more earthquakes in the world. 85% of earthquakes in the world is going to happen here in the ring of fire, okay? In front of Peruvian coast, we have the beautiful Pacific Ocean, yes, but with two different temperatures which is a little bit crazy too yeah from the south pole we got the humboldt current coming and as you can imagine if it's coming from the south pole the water is very very cold yeah however uh, we got a lot of the fishes over there and the, our ocean is also very rich yeah but this one crashes in the north coast of peru with the warm equatorial current El Nino Korean. Say no more, say no more. Even in Canada, no, this not El Nino. <laughs> that is messing around with our weather, yeah? 
And yeah, this is um, a little bit closer explanation about El Niño current crashing with the Humboldt current. And you know that everything about the weather is temperature. And if you have a change of half of a degree here and there, it's going to affect our weather, our rains, and everything else. Okay, so it's kind of fragile, our, <laughs> our weather is here, yeah? And because of the ring of fire, well, we are not flat, yeah? If you cut Peru as a cake, it's something like this. Yes, <laughs> as you can see here, so many, many different altitudes that we get to deal with, yeah? Uh, so yeah in peru especially well here in the city i live in cusco former capital of the incas we got a, a tropical high mountain i mean when you go outside and the sun is there it's a super hot tropical sun with a uv radiation that the records are 17. <laughs> uv radiation is wild okay and if you go to the shadow, suddenly you're freezing, of course, yes, because we are still 11,000 or three uh, or 3,300 meters above sea level, okay? So, and so many different altitudes in between. I know it sounds complicated because actually uh, it is very complicated. That's why it sounds like that. <laughs> it cannot sound simple because it's complicated, but uh, because we want to tell the things that we learn here later to our family, <laughs> I can give you some facts that you can remember uh, and share with others, okay? The combination of all of those factors and more, because the, the, the interpretation of this that I'm going to give you was during the last century. It's been re-evaluated and they have to investigate this again. So it's going to change a little bit probably, but this is what is official, okay? If in the world exist 114 microclimates, today call it uh, zones of life by the biologist, in the world we have 114. Peru got 84 of them. <laughs> yes, I know, <laughs> it's wild. And we are not that big again, okay? So everything is combined here. Only... 19% of Peruvians, today's Peruvian territory is good for agriculture. It's very few. It's muy poquito, yes? Uh, I made my exchange program in Kansas, and I can tell you, eh, flat. <laughs> so super flat in the States, especially flat, flat. And you can make massive farming over there because everything is so flat, yeah? Here is not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen to make massive farming because our territory got tropical deserts too, tropical high mountain in a territory like this. Our jungle area, uh, the jungle is only for the local plants. They cannot uh, be good for agriculture because of the biodynamics they got. And half of our uh, uh, jungle is flooded the whole year because... Uh, I know that everybody thinks that the Amazon rivers is just from Brazil, but actually no. This starts in Peru, the Amazon river, and then goes to Brazil. So a crazy amount of water has to be collected here to start the Amazon river. In Peru? In Peru? Yes, in Peru. Yeah. As I was telling you, we have a crazy high UV radiation that was... Um, something that we study here and then we decided to do something about that and now our planetario is powered by the sun <laughs> because one we are one of the hottest spots in the world uh, with high uv radiation so we decided to use it for good yeah and uh, according to the uh, fragility of ecosystems we are the second country in the world affected by global warming which is quite sad quite sad <clears throat> if we consider economical factors, we are in number 17. That is still very bad. Yeah, very bad. If we consider that we got around 200 countries. Yeah. So as you can imagine, in difference of uh, my brothers and sisters of Center America, that got a very, very rich land. I don't know if you were any time in Mexico, Guatemala, but you just 
throw a seed and you have a tomato like this big. Okay, maybe not that big, but very big. Yeah? <laughs> they have a very fertile land, even they have their own challenges, but it's not uh, that hard as is in the tropical lands. So the main use for astronomy was for making agricultural calendars. Our society was so focused in making agricultural calendars to interpret all the messy environment that we got in a book that everybody could read. The patterns in the sky. Yeah, that was our main use. We didn't have time of trying to speak the languages of the gods through math. <laughs> we didn't have time for that <laughs> because actually we love to eat. Yeah, so we have to, and we need to eat uh, anyway. Yeah, so our main focus was that the astronomers have to check all the patterns in the sky and everything that they can interpret to make agricultural calendars. Yeah, that was our main focus. All the Incas culture, again, was focused on making agriculture. Yeah. The good thing is that everybody in the world is enjoying that today, yeah, because we developed absolutely wonderful products. Just naming one, the potatoes. Yeah, yeah, Peru and Bolivia developed these potatoes. You are welcome. You are welcome. Yeah, <laughs> my ancestor did that <laughs> thousands of years. So yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so uh, we have talked about geography as we talk about uh, space. Yeah. And now we have to know, okay, we cannot talk about the space without uh, without talking about time. What about time, yeah? The thing is that what we know as Inca, 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 yeah, as you know, the Incas with their own uh, aesthetics and beliefs and everything, it's a period of time of only 95 years. So, Many people ask, okay, how one of the greatest civilizations in the ancient world can develop in less than a century? Not aliens, <laughs> I swear, <laughs> not aliens, no. <laughs> or many people think that, but no. What we get to understand is that the Incas were the last chapter only of a much, much, much longer novel. Uh -huh. Hundreds of civilizations develop in this territory of the Incas, the Tahuantin Suyo. That is not only Peru. No, the Incas, we are six countries. It's part of Colombia, a good part of Ecuador, of Peru, of Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. That's how far we got, okay? They have a crazy, amazing political project that we in our occidental mind cannot interpret it. We cannot really get it now, how important it was. But the idea was joining everybody together, small civilizations that got, they say, okay, let's keep our biodiversity, let's keep our diversity in the ethnics, in the products, in the languages, in the religions, but, Everybody has to speak Quechua as a common second language or first language, I don't know. And all the gods are welcome, but above all, there is father son in the top of this. Okay, we agree and we agree. We were like teenagers <laughs> having a crisis because it was a very young country and the Spanish arrived, the conflict was already there, the diseases, came here, we were not ready for those diseases, and the story couldn't uh, have <laughs> a good finish, of course, yeah? But yeah, please remember this, yeah? That we are the last chapter of many novels. But there are civilizations around the world that they have one civilization for thousands of years, like the Egyptians. Why we didn't? Why we got so many chapters in this novel? Why? That's something that we study in, in a school and we never wonder why. And this is the sad part, yeah? Many civilizations raise and fall and disappear, raise, fall and disappear because of huge climate crisis. 
Yeah. El niño fenomena for five years, you cannot survive five years without food, right? Especially because of the fragility of ecosystems, they fall. They pretty much migrate somehow. They were somewhere else, they disappear. And they pop again somewhere else, another civilization trying to deal with the environment. They pop and disappear, they pop and disappear, yeah? The biggest states, when we finally start lasting uh, more than 100 years, uh, well, the, the Incas didn't have the time to, but they were supposed to be able to last even thousands of years. But before them, the states were growing more and more because they develop science, they develop technology, ancient technology. I know, not bring by the aliens, no. <laughs> it was developed here, yes? And it was a basic but a smart, super smart technology for making dehydration of food, yeah? Yeah, here in Peru, we don't got the very cold winters, let's say that you have in US or in Canada when you cannot even go outside, yeah? But we have the lack of uh, water and the lack of rains, yeah? They try to make overproduction every time they could. And they developed the technologies for uh, dehydrating these products, yeah? With salt, with lime, with herbs, putting some products in the in the rivers, yes? So they go through a process of fermentation, yes? And then it go easily dehydrated and they could last much, much longer, yeah? Uh, we dehydrated potatoes, we dehydrated corn, we dehydrated quinoa, uh, we even dehydrate meat. And the proof of that is of course, the English war for dehydrated meat, that is beef, jerky, right? You hear jerky, most of you, jerk, jerky, yes? And jerky comes from the original Quechua word, charqui. <laughs> In Quechua is charqui, huh? That proves that we invent that, just saying. That proves that we invent that, okay? <laughs> Then the Spaniards start taking those back home and it was precious food because allowed us the navigation go for longer period of time. So they were looking as hard as they were looking for gold. They were looking for the colcas to take the dehydrated food to survive overseas. Yeah, it was also a huge revolution. Nobody talks a lot about that, but it is, yeah. And uh, also the high UV radiation that, uh, believe me, can let you very dry <laughs> if you are exposed 20, 24, um, no, 24 hours, no, it, it cannot be, it's at night, well, 12, 12 hours a day <laughs> and um, during the whole year, yeah, because even in our winters, we got sun with very cold winds coming from the mountains, but even in the winter, we got very sunny days, yes. Here we got the colcas, the places when they storage the food, yeah? So everything of this, all of this was developed through the deep understanding of cycles of earth, yeah? Reflected in the cycles in the sky. That's why it was very rich, our astronomy. It was our library, yes? Everything that we needed should be explained there, but beautiful stories, yeah? A uh, basic math is that the ancient Peruvians got a lot of things to do uh, for surviving, and we developed it here very early agriculture tools. Yeah, uh, they cannot, it's not a <laughs> privilege that they got to be just nomads. They started with being um, nomads, but in the summertime, they have to settle to plant. Very basic agriculture, it's not even agriculture, it's horticulture. But the math is this. We know that the adaptation of the potato is around 8,000 years of adaptation, of domestication. The corn, it's around 9,000 years. And our oldest civilization is 5,000 years. That means, just math, we have to start before <laughs> even being into a civilization, okay? So yes, we got a very long tradition of stargazers. The proof is this one that we got 
the ancient astronomical observatory in the whole continent, in whole America, located in Peru. It is beautiful. It's amazing. In a natural hill, they build it. Not only three markers for the solstice and the equinox, both of them the same size. No, they make in the hill 13 towers. 13. Why 13? In a symbolic way, it could be the moons in a year. We are not sure, but probably. Yeah. We got the markers, as you can see in this beautiful picture of the solstice in the opposite sides. Around the middle, uh, we have the place where both solstices are located. But as we have so many markers in between, a visible change on the position of the sun could be visible every uh, two top three days in the solstice. More than we can actually need it on those days, yes? So it was made here. The temple area uh, is in another side. They have two walls, but seems not to be for defensive um, uh, purposes because they got too many doors in between. It was more probably about rituals that you got to go to the next stage, to the next stage. These ancient civilizations in part in this part of Peru usually manage their political uh, power and the religious power through the use of um, magical plants, you know, San Pedro, things like that, okay? So uh, maybe that. But it's still a mystery. It's such a big mystery that we are not even sure who built it. Yeah, it's the only remain that this civilization left, okay? And this is also fascinating. And it's coming from around, uh, yeah, mm, one uh okay three thousand years ago yeah it's one thousand three hundred years before christ okay and yes this is how a tropical desert looks the people used to live here imagine that how hard is that yeah it's very hard yeah bien ay ay okay and we got here a the ancient city of the world, yes? No, of the Americas too. That is uh, Caral. It's a beautiful, amazing city in uh, Caral. That is a uh, um, uh, super valley in the uh, north area of uh, Peru, of Lima, like, uh, 1,000, uh, 400 kilometers north from Lima, is a city that was built in uh, pre-ceramic times. I don't know if you can imagine that, but it's pre-ceramic times, okay? And uh, it was recently discovered, and the alignments that they were found just last year proves that they have alignments with the sun, with the moon, and with the brightest star. And Caral is located uh, in, the, in time in five thousand years ago yeah okay and again as i was telling you the great thing that we developed such a wonderful food is because of this scientific fact 60 percent of the plants that are feeding the world right now are native american yeah this is a, a data that i took from the um, american indian museum yes so more than a half of the food that is holding the world was developed in America. But again, as I was telling you, Peru and Bolivia make the biggest part <laughs> with the potatoes. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Most of you got the right answer, uh, but it's a good point. How can we see dark constellations, right? I'm going to reply that in the next uh, part of the lecture that I'm, uh, we are giving. And so we give the last one, the last question. So you want one more? We will do that. One second, stop sharing. And I will uh, launch the final one for you. And that's this one here. Did the Incas have stellar objects as gods? That is the question, right? Okay. Yes. Ancient cultures worship it, something that they did not understand. Yeah. Yes but only as symbols of life. The perception of a sacred order was also plausible. And no, 
They were too busy making agriculture. <laughs> yeah, so it's up to you now. Bien, yes, and she, well, it's part of truth, it's part of truth, yes. Uh, symbols of life. But you know that the perception of something superior of the moon and the sun, it's also perceived, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, we have some chronics that said that the, um, uh, we have a conception of a, not a creator, but like something like an architect. And actually the word is apu, iyapun apu texebira cochapachaya chachi. Yeah, it's such a huge concept that starts with the word uh, Iya, that it's light, yeah, and everybody wow. that is familiar to astronomy, we know how important light, light is <laughs> important and the messenger of the language of the universe, yeah, so somehow in a very intuitive way, they knew this, Texi uh, Viracocha is like a primary soup of a soup, and we that the people that study cosmology knows that this is also something that makes a lot of sense. And it's also talking about an order of every single element. That is uh, what we can translate as cosmos. Yes, it's an order in the things that are going on in the universe. So that is what is interesting. Yeah, they have the sun and the moon uh, as visible close gods, yes? But they are not the only gods that they used to get. And yes, and even they were very, very busy making agriculture. Um, when you have hard environment, not having faith uh, is it's not very logical, especially in ancient days. Yes, because even if the environment is hard, you have to put some faith and some things to the gods and praise to the gods. So uh, everything that you are trying to do, it's going to go well anyway. Yeah. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to take those questions. And we have some fun for sure. The answer for the dark constellations, it was that, yeah, we have to interpret the sky, but not only uh, with few elements. We have to interpret a lot of calendars because we got a lot of weathers and environments and cycles of life. So the sun calendar was used, yes, especially with the four main dates, solstice and equinox. We use moon calendars, yes, because it's very visual to have the moon going from full moon to full moon in around a month, yes? And the stars calendars, even planet calendars, were used right here, yeah? We did have stellar constellations, of course, yes? We have, for example, the Pleiades, known as the Colcas, the storehouses that I was talking to you about. The Lyra was placed uh, in the drones like a llama. A Scorpio, the, uh, the, oh, the Scorpion was draw as a, a snake, a sacred snake, just like the Big Dipper that we can see in Peru, the Big Dipper, yes, but upside down. Yeah, that's why it have this shape, yeah? It's the top of our northern sky. Orion was known as a bridge to the sky. The Southern Cross was also known as something as a bridge. But uh, more than the group of stars that any draw that they make above it, yes? And it was mainly for agricultural reasons. And the stars also have special names like Sirius, that is the brightest star in the sky, known as the sacred star, the most important of all stars, yeah? So this is a little bit of the stellar constellations. But we got this, that is our theme today, that is the dark constellations. In the Southern Hemisphere, we do get a spectacular view of the Milky Way, yeah? For us, it could be in the center of the sky, and we can see from the Southern Cross, that is around this area, to the other side that is not visible in the north, okay? So it's absolutely fantastic. The glowing river that I was talking about is actually the Milky Way that for us was known as a great river, Hatun Mayu. Yeah, the Hatun Mayu is the great river, is the Milky Way that we see in the sky. 
How can we see dark constellations in the night? Because are against the light of the galaxy, of the center of the galaxy, actually. These dark areas exist. The Herschel brothers, when they make the map of the universe through the telescope and counting the stars, they find some areas that apparently they were fewer stars. It's just because of the presence of this matter. It's not dark matter. <laughs> it's not dark energy. It's black matter, yes? It's gases, interstellar uh, dust, interstellar gas, uh, carbon, ice, yeah? And these formations are the those that absorb the lights from the other side. The Inca saw that very well with zero light pollution here. It's amazing how clear they could see in these dark areas. They organized this huge object in the sky that is the Milky Way with the dark constellations and allowed us to have a better understanding of the Milky Way. Believe me, when I see a picture of the Milky Way, I can check in an intuitive way if it was taken very early in the morning or at uh, just before the sunrise, or uh, uh, if I you see, okay, this uh, the Southern Cross is above here, uh, should be done uh, lower than Australia, as Aust uh, and things like that. So it's going to be very helpful if they if they were included <laughs> in the official nomenclature. Yeah, just like in the Andes because we have to live in a community, because we got to make synergia, because we have to make that one plus one is not two, but three. We have to support each other. The community, the work in community is very important. And the same is reflected in the dark constellations. The first one, it's around here. I hope that you can see like this that I'm pointing. This bright star is actually Alpha Centauri. This is Beta Centauri, and they are pointing the Southern Cross. This is the eye of these first characters that have a head, a couple of ears, long neck, body, and the legs. And this is, yeah? Oh, other cultures also identify this, sorry. Yeah, and it's the uh, big black lamb, yeah? You can see it? It's very easy, yeah? It's right there, yeah? And it's a big lab. I found out a myth that said that llamas, alpacas, vicuñas, uh, guanacos are not a gift from the gods to us. They are something that the gods borrow. Oh, and that changed everything. So we don't, we cannot be mean to these guys. We cannot be mean to the alpacas because the day that the last alpaca is gone, the earth will be wiped off by the gods. Okay, just saying, be kind with the llamas and alpacas. Okay, <laughs> and it's reflected because it was a very important part of our culture. We use everything of the llamas, the wool, uh, the llamas and alpacas, especially, right? The wool, the meat, the bones are made for making instruments. Um, the uh, they the 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 poop the poop of the llamas are a great fertilizer okay so everything is used that's why they are so beloved and they can eat very poquito very very few just little grass in the high andes and that's enough for them okay that's why they are very beloved if you have a female llama of course uh, as part of the family it's a it's a good news because you're going to have more llama so the llama in the sky is female, and we know that because below her is the baby llama, yeah? And the baby llama, the mama takes good care of her because, of course, it's very little, and it's a good mama, it's a good mama llama, yes? <laughs> and also because very close to her, we can see a little bit of the head of the baby llama here, we got the mischievous guy. Oh! The Atocha is the fox. If you don't have their wolves in the histories, we have here our foxes, okay? The fox is right here. The eyes of the fox are the stinger of a Scorpio that is above the Milky Way. This is Antares. I, I hope that you can see. This is a Scorpio and the stinger of a Scorpio are the eyes 
of the uh, zorrito, of the atocha, yes? Uh, yeah, you, you, I know that you will need a little bit of practice, but I swear that is there. <laughs> yeah? Uh, and here, yeah? And around here is the face of the zorrito, yeah? And of course, at this point of the story, we do need a hero, and here we got, yeah, is the shepherd. Okay, uh, for taking care of the llamas, we can have adults, kids, boys, girls, yeah, but it's most likely that the shepherd were girls. And for me, it makes sense because the shepherd fights like a girl, runs like a girl, and is brave like a girl. So it's girls, <laughs> yes. And you can see the head of the shepherd, one arm here, the other arm in this position that is very long and it's very easy to see in the uh, pictures of the Milky Way and the legs. In the top of the slingshot, the shepherd uh, placed a red stone that is Antares from a Scorpio, the brightest star in a Scorpio. Yeah, so they are mixed sometimes with um, uh, ester uh, with the stars, yes? Dark constellations with some stars. And watching everything from the highs and checking that we are making a good job, we have the Andean condor. You can even see the white scarf that the condor is using with the wings spread, yeah? And the, the condor is very important also in the Anders, of course, because it's the representative of the higher world of the Hanach Pacha. Okay, take the reference of the Southern Cross and the pointers. At this side of the Milky Way, we have other characters, three other characters, okay? That are also very important. Actually, in the Southern Cross, here is the Southern Cross. This is the, uh, a dark area called the Coal Sack. I think it's the only dark area in the whole Milky Way that have an official name. I mean, with something that you can remember besides the letters and numbers, this is the Colsac Dark Nebula. Mm -hmm. uh, the astrophotographers know it, okay? This is beautiful to take pictures of, yeah? This dark area was known as Yutu, that it's a bird, yeah? Here, this is the chubby body, the head, even the beak is uh, visible and is next to the Southern Cross. You know that the U2 is not, you know, nothing spectacular about the U2, yeah? The, the feathers are not that good. The singing is not that good. He can almost not fly. Uh, the best thing that it got is camouflage, but it's very beloved in the Andes. Why? Because it got eggs of beautiful colors. What happened? Well, they said in ancient days, it was uh, not a float, but a huge fire in the whole world, yes? And everything was in risk. And the YouTube took the rainbow and hide the rainbow in the eggs, yeah? To save the rainbows. And that's why now the eggs are painted with many different colors. But if you like rainbows, you actually have to thank this guy, yeah? Even is not that fancy or anything. <laughs> He's... Uh, the reason why we have rainbows today, yeah? This is the YouTube guy. We have a very beloved animal that is the, well, it's not an animal, it's, it's an amphibia, but what? the toad, yeah? The toad is very beloved too because this guy in this season sings, yeah? All the time in the night. And it's because this singer have to bring the rain to Pachamama so we can start the rainy season. Yeah, that's why it's very beloved. But I found another beautiful story about the toad. And it's that when you have a field of potatoes and a plague is coming, Pachamama, Mother Earth, turned. No, Pachamama didn't give us the power to, to create dark matter and dark energy. But Pachamama can transform the biggest potatoes into toads. They rise to the, from the ground and they eat all the insects and they protect the sea bees. That's why they look a little bit <laughs> bumpy. Is <laughs> because they used to be potatoes, okay? So be kind with the toads anyway too. And at this part of the river, there is another minor water snake called Machahuay that is also a great control for plagues. So they were 
below the bed and somehow yes worshipped in the sky as protectors of agriculture again remember how important was agriculture yeah and for finishing the i i didn't tell you yet the story of the big black llama the big black llama was so important yeah because uh, she's in the sky yeah she's a sacred llama of course and very late at night when nobody's seeing her she comes to her yeah because she's very thirsty in the dry season and she comes to earth and she starts drinking water from the rivers from the lakes from the springs and if she's still thirsty she go even to the ocean to drink water yeah and then she's full and she's back to the sky she walks around it will be there quiet no problem but you know what happened when you drink too much water right <laughs> if you drink a lot a lot of water the natural process of your body will be releasing the water of course <laughs> and that happened around november okay when the llama decided to give us back all the water she got as rain <laughs> for our agriculture yeah <laughs> i know it's a crazy story i know if you're laughing i hope you are <laughs> but explain something quite serious that is the unique cycle of water in the tropical landes and the only two seasons we got rainy season and dry season and that could be explained by a position of a cosmic llama in the sky yeah rainy season dry season rainy season dry season because the idea of you having falls with the leaves falling and the springs with flowers blossoming and the freezing winters and the super hot summers is something that we see in movies and in books it's not going to happen here yeah we don't even have to change our clothes the whole year except for jackets for the rain yeah and we still have fall big sales <laughs> spring <laughs> big sales and we don't need it anyway <laughs> capitalism <laughs> yeah and so uh, this is the presentation what it's about and i want to tell you goodbye in my native language in quechua that it's añay and añay means gracias means thank you thank you very much for taking the time for sharing something that is so different for what you know uh, in the name of uh, diversity to expand the human knowledge thank you for your patience even with my english and with my mom <laughs> thank you <laughs>